Upload. And starting webinar. Let's open the gates. Yay. Welcome everybody who's rolling in. We're going to give it a couple of minutes while everybody gets in and we'll get started right on time. Yeah, thanks for everybody. Thanks everybody for joining us this evening. Um, and this is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel in the coming days. And feel free to introduce yourself um, on the chat and you know, use the Q&A for questions and use the chat as well. We'll be monitoring it throughout um, our webinar. Oh, it looks like we've got people from all over the state, Pasadena yeah. to Mendo, Santa Maria to Fresno. We'll give everybody a chance to continue rolling in and then we'll get started in just a moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is great. San Diego, Oakland, Tarzana. Oh, oh, this is great. Santa Rosa, you're just up the road. <laughs> Oh, Valley, Gilroy. Oh, we have Redlands. That's where my family's at. All different kinds of watering challenges. Yeah. Well, it's still, the numbers are still just rolling. So we'll give it just a second as we're, as people are rolling in. Feel free to yeah. join the Sebastopol too. That's up near me. More Sebastopol, Palo Alto. Wow, we really have the whole state coming in, it looks like. Hey, yeah. We just need somebody from the Eastern Sierra to weigh in and we'll kind of have it. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. This is fun. We should have people use this chat to introduce themselves for future webinars. It's exciting to see everybody coming in. Oh, yeah. we saw Grass Valley. We got the foothills. And like I mentioned earlier, this is going to be, this is being recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube channel as well. Then everyone registered will get a follow-up email with the URL to the recording as well. Oh, Mill Valley. I'm from Mill Valley. Nice. <laughs> yep. Watering challenges across the state, like Carrie said, no matter where we are, the very mm -hmm. different ones in some areas, but it's a good time to talk water yeah. and to make all the bad pens. What are you doing over there? Yeah. All right. I get started. Yeah. Now people still rolling in. So we'll probably repeat ourselves on some of the information a couple of mm -hmm. times as far as using the Q&A to ask us questions and chatting amongst yourselves and, and introducing yourselves in the chat. Mm -hmm. right. Let's roll. Yeah. Um, so thanks everybody for joining. Um, we are diving into our Native Plant Gardening 101 and discussing watering native plants. Um, as you know, the wet season is right around the corner. So we thought we'd focus on getting back to the basics and the fundamentals of watering native plants. And in this webinar, we are gonna go over an introduction um, and introduce ourselves and go over, you know, why we water and how, um, and then kind of dive into the nitty gritty of irrigation and different considerations with choosing the frequency and type of watering with native plants um, and the basics of how to water and a general watering schedule and resources for you. So it's a lot we're gonna cover in an hour. Um, and my name is Maya Argamon and I am the CNPS Horticulture uh, Programs Coordinator. It's a mouthful every time. <laughs> And I'm Anne-Marie Benz, I'm the Horticulture Programs Manager, and I'm enjoying watching you all roll in here and seeing the representation from it being fully all over the state. Yeah. And California yeah. is such a large state with so many different interesting places. Yeah, so much diversity. It's great. So why water? Um, so 
we water plants um, because plants need water for growth via photosynthesis. Um, and an important distinction is that you are watering the soil for uptake via the plant's roots. Um, and despite the recent rains that we've experienced throughout our state, California is still in a drought. Um, this map um, really shows you know, the severity of drought in California um, and the outlook is not looking great. Um, we're, you know, we're, never, we're not gonna get any more water you know, just with product, projections of climate change. So it's really important um, to limit our water use um, and native plants are a wonderful way to do that. Um, they, once native plants are established, they gener generally require much less water um, than non-native counterparts. Um, so they've also evolved to survive extended periods of drought and arid conditions um, in our generally dry climate. Um, so these are all great reasons to, you know, plant native plants in the watering context. As Maya mentioned, it's, or, and you could see in the map there, we're still in drought in so many areas. So, and there are a lot of different ways to look at watering. I, I know irrigation can, as a topic, can be a little bit controversial with native plants. Um, we're going to go over, though, different types of irrigation, what's involved in a full irrigation system, and some of the basics of what you should know. And then we'll talk about other kinds of watering and watering schedules as well. But irrigation is the artificial watering, and it's really meant to give you, to deliver supplemental watering when there isn't enough water to it in the natural system. This often helps with establishment or it can be supplemental. Um, we all know rain is best. Uh, and in a perfect world, we would have native soils, we would have plenty of rainfall, we would have the original watershed still in place, but we deal with the world as it is, not as we wish it was. So while we work on you know, having good, healthy ecosystems for our plants, Sometimes they're planted in areas where they're a little bit challenging and with climate change, it gets even a little bit more challenging. So we're gonna talk about the irrigation piece. You know, really, what is, the, what is irrigation and how does it work? So irrigation for most homes are, is a series of water delivery systems, sprinklers, irrigations, applicators that are powered by the water pressure behind a single irrigation valve. They, there's often an electrical irrigation controller and a full system behind that that helps to get the water to the plants when they're thirsty. And by to the plants, what we really mean is the soil surrounding the roots. We're looking to have the plants take up water from the soils in the, into their root systems and the root systems to help to feed the plants in that way. So most irrigation systems are going to have a whole series of pieces in them. They're going to have a main line, the thing the, the big piece that runs through your planting, through your yard, through your system. They're gonna have zone lines, the smaller pieces coming off of those and going to each piece. They're going to have heads or the spigots for your irrigation things, the little pieces that the, water's come at, the water comes out of. They're going often gonna have valves um, valves are the devices that open and close the system and kind of let it through. They should have a shutoff valve. A shutoff valve is a near, you know, it's like the shutoff valve to your sink, to your house, any of those. A way to shut down the system for repairs, for problems, any of the pieces that you may need. Often you're also going to have a backflow preventer, things that'll, you know, keep it from backing up. You're gonna have a controller, which is kind of a brain of the system. So you're gonna have something that could potentially be, um, you know, regulating the system for you. Now we know that most systems don't have as good 
of brains for native plants perhaps as they could. So I'm gonna start, I'm gonna put up for just a moment a, a poll to try and get an understanding from all of you about what are your biggest watering challenges. So it's gonna come up here and we're gonna give it just a moment to start populating. And for those of you who came in after the introduction, feel free to ask questions in the Q&A of us or to chat and introduce yourselves in the chat function. Um, the chat function is also a great area to get questions answered because there are a lot of really knowledgeable people in here as well. Um, it's also a great way to meet people in your region. I saw a couple of people in my area pop up. Um, so we'll give this just another moment here. Um, and then we'll end the poll and kind of take a look at what our biggest watering challenges are. So any of these topics that we're gonna go over today could be expanded into its own full talk. So we'll go over different pieces of it. And if we're not hitting all the pieces, we very likely are going to hit them in a different talk. Because an hour, as much as it seems, just really isn't all that much time to really get into depth. So we are pretty much at full participation for the people who are participating. I'm gonna end poll here and share the results. It looks like the biggest challenge is often how often to water, followed up by what type of irrigation and better watering, water site, watering cycle choices. And then some on native plants shouldn't have irrigation. In a perfect world, native plants wouldn't need irrigation. Um, and we hope you help us work towards that. A lot of native plants don't need irrigation once they're established. So just putting it out there. Once they're established, they don't need additional irrigation. But some, there's obviously a lot of uh, um, variations and you know every plant and garden is different. So sometimes they don't, just so. Yeah, and part of that uh, establishment, we'll go, we'll go over site, you know, watering cycles and later into the thing. But, ir but establishment's a whole thing in itself. So we're gonna look at a couple of different ways of watering. Hand watering, a cute little con container part, hose watering, spray watering. Um, they give you some great options. It's really reactive. Um, you're engaged with your garden and with your plants. A wise woman has taught me that the best thing you can put on your garden is your shadow. So when you're out there watering, you're seeing your plants, you're interacting with them. They're doing some great things. You can try and mimic your, you know, what the watering would be if it was coming from the sky. Watering lightly with a hose is a fairly safe way to give plants a little bit of extra moisture, particularly during summers. It dusts off the leaves, all of that. It's great for interim pieces. It's great for smaller pieces. It's a big challenge if you have a large space that is going to need watering on a regular basis and you're committing to, to hose or hand watering. It, it's a commitment that you're taking on. And I don't think everybody always realizes the commitment and that particularly during establishment, it takes a lot of care and being aware. So planting something right before summer, thinking you're gonna hose water, going on vacation, can be a bad combination. But if you know what you're getting into, if you have smaller areas, um, I believe we have a, a lot of our staff that has smaller pieces in their yard that, and they hose water when needed, when you have rough times, when you have extra heat, drought, um, it can be a viable way of doing it. So I'm not gonna to go too far into it because it's not the most difficult part. But probably our most controversial is drip irrigation. There are whole articles. You can go very deep into the weeds on this one. Drip irrigation is in some ways the easiest and the hardest form of watering on these. I ran miles of irrigation before I truly knew what I was doing. Um, it mostly worked, but I was, do, I was using it in repairing and restoration for establishment. We were using it to supplement during dry area, dry years, during a repairing and restoration, 
to help establish the plants in that area, mostly cottonwoods and willows. And we had an 80% survivorship rate when we used it for the first two years of establishment during the dry times. So it can be terrific for places like that. Uh, drip irrigation is great for achieving a deep soak. It can be low enough flow that it's measured in gallons per hour, which makes it a really popular choice for groups that are doing water savings. Um, your water department, probably a huge fan. But there are things to be aware of too. You want to avoid placing the emitters near the crowns of the plant. Um, you don't want anything that could cause root rot in that way. You want to install enough emitters or set the grid to wet all of the soil where the roots are going to grow. You want the water to move down the soil through gravity and capillary action. And you want the capillary action to get to the soil particles that will really hold the water and allow the plants to uptake it. So as your plants grow, you want it to be able also to move these around. It's a really easy form to hide under your mulch and then to kind of move as your plants are growing and as their, their root systems are growing. You don't want to have just a single emitter right by the base of the plant. It seems like an easy way to run the system. They're fairly intuitive. Most nurseries, including most um, hardware stores will have kits for this and they'll be able to talk you through it but they might not give you the basics. You know, you're running this hose, it's really easy to pop an emitter and want to put it right by the stem of the plant. And what you want instead of doing that, because that could create a, um, it could train your plant to form a tiny root ball right near that drip point. You wanna have it spread out and you want to be watering all of the soils to let the soil, um, feed the root system. And then you need to know your plants and need to know, do they need a deep soak? Which is something you're gonna need with, to know with each of them. Do you need less often, do you need a deep soak to let it go deeper? Are you working with something that's relatively shallow? Space it out through your root balls, so your root area. So it's an important thing to learn your plant but this is one form of watering that is easy to put in. It's easy to move about. And particularly if you're doing it for establishment period, it makes it fairly easy to move it around, to make it reactive, to add emitters, to close things um, without using a whole lot of water in it. And similar to drip, Micro sprays are kind of a cross between a surface spray and drip irrigation. It's not the best picture once we blow it up this big, I'm realizing on the bigger screen, but I think you get the idea. Um, it's a very tiny sprinkler piece as opposed to that. It's a micro spray, literally means what it is. It is spraying the water, um, which gives you some really great advantages and has some drawbacks. Um, it has the the advantages like drip irrigation, um, it's a very low pressure irrigation. Um, you're looking at 15 to 30 PSI often. So micro sprays are also delivered through micro tubing and then a series of nozzles that are attached to risers. The risers may be fixed or designed to pop up. And like I talked about at the beginning, all these are gonna have a main line and then lines coming off of them. You're gonna have controllers. This is a different type of emitter than having the small ones on a drip line, these ones pop up and will spray. Um, in either case, you know, it's easy to see that they're functioning. It's easy to see when they're not working, um, which is a problem occasionally with drip irrigation. People say they don't know if it's working, they don't know if, it, if it's gone off for the day, things like that. This is really easy to, to watch and understand when it's working. Um, it provides a lot of the same benefits as drip in that you can get really targeted. You can help get out to the roots. This one will do a little bit of the rain effect. It'll come down onto the plants, help you to rinse some of the, you know, particularly if you're in a highly urban area or a dust area, some of the, rinse the plants a little bit, um, get a large, larger wetted area. 
which might bring in more weeds. Um, the higher flow rate slightly than the drip gives you a little bit of chance to overwater. Depending on where you place them, you may have problems with um, watering onto hard, hard surfaces. So you need to be aware of where you're placing them, that they're not watering onto your sidewalk, your driveway, areas that you don't want them to be. Um, there's also a fair amount of it that precipitates out because you're spraying into the, into the air. Uh, the maintenance for micro sprays is really similar to drip irrigation. What you're doing is making sure that when you have things that are spraying with really small emitters, they can get clogged up. Depending on your well or your, your municipal system, they might have little bits of calcified pieces or little bits of sand, all the things that get into our water systems occasionally. Um, so you're, you need to check them on a semi-regular basis, make sure that they're still flowing, replace them, clean them as needed. Um, these type of lines often get chewed by rodents. Um, I have a couple of squirrels that are very enthusiastic about them. Not quite as enthusiastic as they were about the pumpkins over the last couple of months, but they're pretty close on these. It's a really easy way for them to get into water when it's dry out there. Um, microsprays are also a good way you can convert a drip system to microspray emitters fairly easily. And it's a good way to change up the pattern as your plants are changing or as they're growing if you need to. And then finally, sprinklers and overhead sprayers. I, I looked for it, I couldn't find, I've got a picture of my youngest running through one of these as a kid. And it's just the epitome of kid joy. Um, the idea that you can run through a sprayer big into, out into the world. Um, it's you know a summertime rite of passage, but they use a lot of water. We're not gonna go really far into them because they use so much water that for most of us, this isn't a good viable option most of the time. Um, overhead sprayer sprinkler systems often come with yards. If you're replacing your yards, there are ways to change out your heads for more low water use heads. I go look at your local irrigation store. Um, a lot of other places will have them. Some of your landscapers should be able to tell you. If that's what your yard came with, and as you're changing it out, you want to reduce your water usage, there's a lot of really terrific options um, for changing those out. And it's one of the quickest ways to actually reduce your water usage. Changing out the heads on a spray system, I believe can save up to 40% of your outdoor irrigation water. So if it's had in, if you're working through your system, um, there are answers for it, I guess is the biggest part. And then I want to talk about other ways of sourcing your water. So we're talking about the basics of the system, what it takes to have a good irrigation system. And many of us are, are on either a municipal system or a well system, but that's not the only way to be watering your yard. Um, rain gardens and other types of land contouring are a terrific way to capture soak in and keep water in your system. They, the rain gardens and contouring of your land, it includes everything from when you install trees, putting in tree wells, making sure on the, if you're on a slope to put the tree well on the downslope side so that it will hold any precipitation that comes through to actually redirecting water off of streets. Some areas allow, re, allow you to do curb cuts and pull storm water off of streets. It's a great way to get a lot of more water into the shallow groundwater table or into your soils that will then slowly release to your plants. Um, this type of rainwater harvesting on your land is also a great way to treat the land that you're on as its own watershed. And in a lot of areas, this is an area where you have a, a a legal responsibility to not have stormwater flows coming off of your land. So learning to contour the land in order to, to keep it in your plants, to let everything soak in. Um, there are some terrific resources and we'll have some of those sent out with the email after this as well. If you came in later, this is all being recorded. You'll get a cop, 
the link to the recording, but you'll also get a lot of resources. Gray water is another option. It's where your household water use is, at least the gray water section is being redirected. You will often see um, laundry to landscape type programs. And that's what they're talking about. Um, putting, plumbing your, your washing machine or other gray water to go out to your landscape. And that can happen in a whole variety of ways. It's a big enough topic that we could do our, a, a full talk on it. And we do have a talk that we did on some of these that's on the CNPS YouTube channel. Um, there are some great resources on it as well that we'll include for you. And then you can also harvest water, harvesting water off of your roofs or other structures and storing them in ones like the tank here, allow you to hold water during the wet times to put out into the dry times. I used to be in Prescott, Arizona. I had 750 gallons of storage on a relatively small house. It didn't take hardly anything to fill it up. And then it allowed me through most of the dry time before we got summer monsoons to be feeding a, or watering a very healthy, large garden. So it, it's a great way to put in a system that will keep your, your landscape hydrated during the toughest times of the year and to use what's already been delivered. In the version I had, we didn't put it into a full irrigation system. We put it up high enough. We had gravity feed and we were hose watering because we knew we were using it supplementally for regionally appropriate garden plants uh, for a food garden. You can also set them up so that they will go to a full irrigation system. So it's a lot of different types of irrigation or of watering available to you. A matter of figuring out which is the right one for you, what your long-term garden goals are or your landscape goals for your space. If you're doing it for supplemental, if you believe you're gonna need long-term irrigation, if your HOA requires it, there's a lot of different filters there. There's also the model water efficient landscape ordinance, which depending on if you're putting in a new landscape, you may have to meet. And if so, we can go into deeper top on that at a different time, or there are some terrific resources out there for you. Great. Um, thanks for going over all of that. Um, I know that was a lot of information. Um, so I'm going to dive into the considerations when understanding the watering frequency um, in your specific space. Um, there's really no one size fits all approach to watering your plants. As I'm kind of sifting through the chat and the Q and A, you know, every space and every plant is unique. And these are some, just some, not all the considerations that go into understanding how and when to water your plants. Um, so in this slide, I'm gonna talk about soil type. Um, understanding what kind of soil your garden has is really important, not only for watering, but for choosing the right plants that will thrive in your space. Um, so generally, for example, um, sandy soils drain rapidly and dry out quickly, um, and heavy clay soils are the opposite, where they retain moisture and take much longer to drain. Um, so that being said, clay soils generally require less frequent irrigation compared to sandy soils, um, but long, slow watering is really necessary to completely wet the root zone. I'm gonna keep going back to this idea of wetting the root zone and watering for um, uptake via the plant roots. You're not, plant, you're not watering the plants, you're watering the roots of the plants. Um, and another consideration is plant choice. Um, Every plant has their own specific watering requirements. Um, so it's really important to understand when you're choosing which plants, what their watering needs specifically are. Um, and not every plant is adapted to every part of the state. So it's, it's really important from the get-go to choose plants that are adapted to your specific area. Um, and calscape.org is a great way to choose plants that work in your space. And on Calscape, they do list the watering requirements for each plant. Um, and really just learn from your own garden and let your plants educate you and trust your educated gut. And you know, 
there's bound to be mistakes. And that's the beauty of gardening and watering and understanding what works um, and what doesn't. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, slope is another consideration with understanding the watering frequency of, of your plants. Um, plantings in a shadier um, and on to the damper northeast slope of hills in your space um, don't need as much water as those in the full sun or in the drier um, southern slopes of hills. Um, and microclimate is a really critical aspect as well. Um, some areas in your yard might have full sun all day if they're south side. Sorry, loud. Um, if they're on the south facing side of your space and others might be in the shade part of the day and in the afternoon get blasts of sun. So it's really important to understand the microclimate of your, of your garden um, and spend time outside and observing how the sun moves throughout your space um, is really, really important. So just really understanding your site. Um, this is a photo I took of Sunset Boulevard in San Francisco and you can see this beautiful native meadow planting, but you know, this only works on the sunny side um, of the boulevard. So this is just a little example of a microclimate. Um, and last but not least, seasonality is an important aspect when understanding the watering frequency. Um, you know, generally during the wet season, you don't need water, but if you want to increase um, watering up to normal rainfall levels and watering is important. Um, and generally you wanna plant your native plants in the fall um, in, in anticipation for rainfall um, and just following the general trend of um, the growth cycle of plants. Um, and, you know, this is not, there are so many other considerations that go into understanding watering frequency, but this covers generally um, important topics. And these also go into selecting your plants in your garden as well. And now I'm gonna go into how to water. Um, so like I was saying, you really wanna deeply water the soil, which is really key to healthy plants. Um, and try to get the water to soak around 18 inches down um, where the roots can access the water for uptake. Um, and the tricky part is giving water enough time to soak through into the soil without causing runoff. So that kind of goes into understanding your soil type. Um, and before you water, it's important to be sure to check if the soil is dry to determine when to water next. Um, you can use a stick or soil probe or your own fingers or a trowel um, just to understand you know, how wet or how dry the soil is. Um, an important tip is to water in the early morning. I hand water um, with a hose and it's really meditative early in the morning to go out there and water. Um, so it's important to water in the morning um, because in the middle of the day, you lose a lot of water to evapotranspiration um, and it's just watering in the morning is ideal. Um, and like I was saying, water around the, around the plant um, is important as well. Um, you want to target where the furthest leaves of the plant reach, which is kind of considered the drip line. Um, Avoid watering around the stem of the trunk of the plant because that can um, increase risk of disease. Um, and yeah, I keep saying it, but water the soil around the plant. Um, and another trick is to hydrozone. And this kind of goes into what I was talking about earlier with plant selection. Um, but hydrozoning is the concept of keeping plants with similar watering needs together. So plant by plant community, use calscape.org to find um, you know, plants that work in your area. Um, and as you're designing your garden, um, you know, put any of the riparian or streamside plants in regularly irrigated or naturally moist areas in your garden in the drought tolerant um, or plants that are from more arid parts um, together. And also another tip is to keep the most water intensive plants closer to your home, especially if you're um, hand watering, um, just makes it easier for your sake. Um, the closer you are, um, the better and just easier. Um, 
And last but not least, um, mulching is an important aspect as well. Um, mulching a brown one to three inches around the plant um, is important because it retains soil moisture, so it saves you water and helps restrict weed growth. And uh, mulching, similarly to watering, you want to avoid mulching around the stem or trunk of the plant um, because that does increase risk of rotting and disease. So um, just mulching around the plant, not directly on the plant is important as well. Um, and now I'm gonna go into the general watering schedule. I know this is a hot topic given the poll results. Um, so this is a very general watering schedule that um, we created. Um, and you really want to take the time to care for the plant when it's getting established. Um, and that's the period of time when the new plant is developing its own root system. So it's really focusing its energy on developing deep, healthy roots before it goes into growth. Um, and it really varies on the plant and where you are in California. Um, but generally it's two to three years for establishment, um, but that's still very general. Um, and when they're getting established, like I was saying, they really need to be checked frequently and watered often and watch for signs of stress. Um, and another note, I think just to make it clear again is, water deeply. So it's really better to have one 30 minute soak once a week um, than, you know, 10 minutes of watering three times a week. So deeply and infrequently is um, an important tip as well. Um, and I'm not going to read through this entire watering schedule, um, but this will be available um, on the recording. But generally the first month you want to water once a week, um, and then as you progress, it, um, it becomes less frequent. Um, and the ideal is, you know, that you don't really need to supply um, additional irrigation once the plants are established. Um, and, you know, deeply watering is really meaning that it's, the water is reaching the plant's root system, which is generally 18 inches down. So that is that, what that means. Um, and I can read it, I can, I, I could go in and read it. Um, I'll just do that, we have time. So, okay, so the first, like I said, the first month water deeply once a week, um, between the first two to four months after planting, you wanna water deeply every other week, um, beyond four months into the first year, um, you want to deeply water once or twice a month, depending on the species and, you know, the amount of water that you're getting um, and where you are in California. Um, and the first year um, in the fall and early winter, you want to water, um, water deeply um, once, you know, every month or so. And then in the wet season, hopefully if you get enough rain, you want, you know, just let the rain to take over. And then the dry season water deeply once a week. Um, and then hopefully once you reach establishment, you really only need to water deeply about every two weeks in the dry season. Um, and year three, similarly to year two, you water deeply in the dry season every three to four weeks. Um, and really try to reduce that um, with no supplemental watering at all, hopefully. Um, and it really, but like I was going into with the considerations, there are, this is just a very general watering schedule. It really depends on all the different factors I mentioned earlier. Um, and another important thing to note is to check with your water district for any drought restrictions. Um, some districts, you know, only allow you to water certain days of the week or, you know, there's more um, restrictions involved as well. So be sure to check in with your local water department for that. And these are some resources for you. Like I mentioned, CalScape is a great online database through CNPS where you can go in and find the right plants that work for your area. Um, and they also include the water requirements for the plants as well. 
Um, and Wu Calls is another is another um, resource available, um, which stands for the Water Use Classification of Landscape Species, and it's a plant source plant search database as well. Um, and you can allow um, to select plants based on the specific water requirements, um, as well as a type of plant as well. Um, and here also is the link to our previous naturehood talk, which went over watering in a drought. Um, so, but we will be sending out a follow-up email with other resources as, uh, as well as resources that were in this chat. Um, and this is just kind of a jumping off point for you. Um, and those are the resources for you. <laughs> Oh, and Anne Marie is going into how the Woo Calls database looks. Oh, totally accidental. <laughs> okay, great. That's great. That's yeah. That's how it yeah. looks. <laughs> that's it. Um, and here are our references. And since um, we have, yeah, sorry, we have a lot of questions, and I wanted to go into some of them. I've been trying to keep up, and if we haven't gotten to you, I'm sorry about that. There's just it's it's going quicker sometimes than I can type. And the general answer is, it depends. We have a lot of different regions and we have a lot of different setups here. But one that came up a couple of times, Maya, you had mentioned watering in the morning as opposed to the evening. And so we have a couple of questions on, on that piece. And you're mm -hmm. muted. There. Yeah, so it's ideally preferable to water in the morning um, just because it has, you know, you have the full day of sun um, that allows the plant time for, you know, the, the water to dry out. Um, and, you know, at night, the water can tend to rest like, near the soil of the plant, which could potentially cause rotting um, or you know, rotting of the roots or more fungal growth. Um, but I mean, it's okay to water in the evening too, if that's the only option. I mean, I know not everyone's a morning person and you know, you have things to do. I don't, you know, I, I have the luxury of not, of, of being able to wake up and go water my plants. So that's, it's okay um, to water in the evening as well. Morning's preferable, but it's okay. Hopefully that answered uh -huh. it. What you don't want to do is do a lot of spray in the heat of the day in a way that's going to leave water on top of your plants and potentially burn them, among other things. Um, another question that we got in various forms was about the watering schedule. And I think probably the best thing to understand with that is that because we have, California is a huge state, we have a lot of different ecosystems, we have a lot of different plants, we have a lot of different people. This is a generalized version. Um, if you're in a water district, you often will also need to be aware of their limitations on whether you're watering on certain days, on whether you're watering, um, you're allowed to water certain amounts on their, their irrigation types. And mit water departments are really trying to do a good job of educating in your area. So if you have questions, they probably have the answers too. There are some terrific water districts in this state, but the, the schedule was an overview. And probably the biggest thing you need is your hands on your soil and on your plants. You want to water if you see your plant looking distressed in a way that would happen if it's in drought, if you see the leaves wilting, if you see those type of things, and if your soil is really dry. So you wanna have your hands, you wanna get your hands dirty. And it's probably the best things we can do for ourselves as well as for our garden. Um, so another one that came up was the idea of watering during dry times, unusually dry times. Yeah, I would recommend also, you know, um, if you want to listen to gardening in a drought, that kind of really goes in the nitty gritty of that. Um, but generally, you know, you want to water to mimic the natural rainfall that California has. So I don't, that didn't really answer it, but yeah, it's okay to water. I think someone asked that about watering during dry winter. Definitely water in a dry winter. Um, California is for the most part set up to be a summer dry climate. 
which thank you, Saxon Holt, for teaching us that term. Um, when we have a winter dry, that's unusual. I live in the coastal redwoods, which in an area that is supposed to be one of the wettest of the, in the state, and it is still unusually dry and we are still on that drought map. Um, when you're in these type of dry times, when you're not, when it's not the normal dry season for you, supplemental watering can be really helpful. And knowing your garden to know how that how much that is helps a lot too. Um, you can overwater plants. Plants drown. Seems totally, you know, counterintuitive that a plant can drown. Um, repairing plants about the only ones who aren't going to get into that. But we had a lot of questions on whether you should water during un unusually dry times. And like everything else, it depends. So. Water during the dry times if your landscape needs it. Um, we also had a question on if this is being is going to be available. It is being recorded. It'll be on the CMPS YouTube. If you've registered, you'll get a bunch of resources and you'll also get um, a link to the recording. And we'll put in some links for things like gray water and water harvesting. There are groups doing really good work around that, and there's some terrific information out there. Um, any clear tips on how to tell the difference between overwatered and underwatered plants? Do you have any, Maya? Because it is. I mean, they're very similar. That's the hard thing. There are sometimes the symptoms are really um, similar. I would say, you know, being sure to check the soil moisture before you water, I think is the biggest tip. That's preventative, I think. You know, don't water if the soil is wet already. Um, so. That's what I would do because they do have generally I've found that they have similar um, signs of stress. So and one of the best that wasn't really the of it. Yeah. That's part of it. Get to know your good local nursery. Find one that you really like, that you trust. They can answer a lot of questions. Um, there are nursery links near you on Calscape or on bloomcalifornia.org. Both of those have links to nurseries near you, and they'll know your area, and they'll know the specific part of the plant in that area. And they're a really good one to be like, here's the picture of my plant. What, what is this thing doing? Why is it looking this way? You know, all the weird questions that come up. Um, like with anything else, it's getting to know the expert in your area is really helpful. And there are chapters. There are 35 chapters throughout California and Baja that have amazingly educated, intuitive, knowledgeable people on these. Um, and also George, a shout out to George on the chat. This is also pretty, yeah. If the leaves, um, leaves of an underwater plant are generally crispy, that makes sense. Yeah, that's a, that's a good tell all also. But I would say, yeah, also just checking the soil before you water. Um, that's Suzanne's tip about watering to support your oldest and largest. Yeah, the trees are having a hard time mm -hmm. during some of these. Um, and also a shout out to the master gardeners, terrific mm -hmm. resources. People who've gone through a lot of education and who can, can help support. We're glad to answer questions too. Both Maya and I are available through the CNPS page and you can email us. And usually mm -hmm. we're pretty good at either getting back to you or directing the right person to get back to you. Um, so there, are, when the email goes out to you, you'll see some of that as well. I'm enjoying watching the chat though, because er I love watching that everybody is able to help support each other on some of these questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, uh, recommendations on moisture meters. I don't think I have a recommendation on which type but if you have a larger landscape, if you're going to be away, if you have um, questions on the moisture in yours, they're really terrific. Having a moisture meter that can check on the plants can be really useful. Um, I don't want to promote one over another type because I haven't seen one that is, I haven't seen an irrigation system that is specific to establishing or supplementally watering native plants yet. 
Should you be with an irrigation company, this might be an option for you and we'd love to talk. Um, if not, it might be something that we should be pursuing. Um, yeah, we've got a lot of people who underwater and who overwater, it looks like. Um, I am historically an overwaterer and then ignore because I thought I did good kind of person. Um, let's see. Going through the questions and we're trying to get through as many of them as possible because we know a lot of these are specific to where you are. We wanna try and get as much information to you as we can. Um, gray water, anything that should not be watered with gray water. And there are. Um, we'll put some links in for the gray water network that does a lot of terrific information on that. And they can get you more information on the specifics in your area of what goes well. With gray water, I want to emphasize using natural detergents. You don't want a lot of chemicals going into your, into your yard through from your house. And there was a question earlier about if you do curb cuts in areas that allow curb cuts or things that would bring street water onto your yard, you're also potentially having contaminants come in. Streets are, we've all seen streets during first flush, the first rain event of a year. The, um, I remember being a little kid and really liking the rainbows. Now I'm a little more afraid knowing what's in the rainbows, um, but that's probably things off of people's cars and various other equipment. However, plants and good soils are one of the best, cheapest, most efficient ways to clean water. Coming out of a, a riparian background, really good, really good native plant systems are a terrific way. That doesn't mean that all of your plants can take everything that comes off of your street. Know your area, um, do a lot of research on that. We've got some terrific resources that you can see up here with Theodore Payne and various other groups, but um, Brad Lancaster, if you're looking at doing curb cuts is probably the best person to read about. But all of these do have the potential and city irrigation sometimes has things that may not be great for um, plants. If you're in an area where you're, you have a, um, I believe in the city water that, you're, that your irrigation system is in an area that gets really hot, you're doing hot water. So every, every irrigation system kind of has its challenges and it's knowing what it is. Soil does have a fil limited filtration ability, but most of what we're gonna get off of the streets isn't gonna be extreme. Um, depends on where you are. Uh, let's see. We have questions on the compost piece, uh, types of compost or types of compost to avoid, um, which is, it, a huge topic all in its own. And if you're, some of you in the chat have ideas on that, it would be terrific. I would say to stay away from gorilla mulches as much as possible, particularly if you're in fire prone areas, they're extremely flammable and they also pick up in the wind, the shredded types. If you're getting, many municipalities have ones that you can get through municipal systems and you can get bark, uh, arbor mulch, if you're getting things off of there, make sure you know what you're getting, that you're not getting seeds, you're not getting um, other kinds of contaminants that might come in, but often they can be good. Wood chip mulch can be terrific to cover your soils. If you're covering your soils, side topic, leave certain areas free of, of mulch to, for your ground dwelling your um, singular ground nesting bees or other kinds of um, pollinators that might need bare soil. Um, and Suzanne put in the chat and we've got a couple of questions on it on Gray Water Action Network, Gray Water Action. Um, so there are some terrific resources for the gray water and we'll try and make sure we get those into the references that we get. Um, Robin's asking about using oak leaves in the garden and all those areas. I, I wouldn't, just the, they're acidic. Um, so, I mean, if you have other sources of mulch, I would probably use that. And yeah, Amory was talking about mulch, not compost. I don't know. I think someone said that, but yeah. Just, 
That's um, just my opinion <laughs> about oak leaves. <laughs> um, and then there, there are a lot of questions coming in kind of consistently. So we're trying to reach you all. Yeah. If we don't well, get to yeah. you, we will, hopefully the resources will get there or you've got our emails now. Mm -hmm. um, colored yeah, mulches, our emails. Yeah. Colored mulches, um, like everything, so many of these, it depends. Colored mulches, it depends. What are they colored with? Do they have dyes in them? Do they have heavy metals? Are they a semi-natural-ish um, dyed? Are you doing it because your HOA requires a certain look? It's a whole different problem or a whole different piece. So there are a bunch of different things on colored mulches and why you should or shouldn't use them. Um, let's see. We've got it's just like gardening. <laughs> For them now. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, also um, on the dyed mulches, are they going to stain? Are they going to run? Are they going to, are you using them? There's all kinds of things depending on what you have. Um, mulches, like everything else, have good, bad, and in between. Um, using your native ones in your area as much as possible is terrific. I live in a redwood forest. I have redwood duff everywhere. I am just pretending that's the look I'm going for because it. Well, it is. Um, rock mulching in hardier places like cactus succulent types, it's a look. Um, if it would be native to your area, that's one thing. If you're putting it in there, it might bake your soil. Um, not really great. I love the look of some of the things that they've done with glass. It can bake your soil. What you wanna do is feed your soil. If you feed your soil, if you care for your soil, your soil will take care of your plants. Um, and yeah, Jim's got a great thing there. Calscape will usually let you know what they want if your plant wants inorganic, such as a, a rock. Um, let's see, plants that look like they were planted three years ago, coffee berries and huckleberries, if they, they're not growing, they're not getting something that they need. Um, on the upside, they're still alive. And I'm assuming that they weren't bought as full grown sizes, but I've seen that come through. So if they're not growing, they're not getting something that they need. Um, let's see. We've got a lot of questions coming in, but we're almost to the end of our time. And I wanna make sure that we wrap up with the basic overview of it is terrific if we don't have to water beyond establishment. Um, with climate change, that might not always be the case. With drought, uh, California is in drought historically a third of the time. With climate change, that's getting more extreme in some areas. We're getting more extremes of everything. The best thing you can do is to get to know your landscape. You know, the best thing you can put on your garden is your, is your shadow. And there are a bunch of great resources that have been in the chat. We'll try and make sure that the chat gets to you as well in all of these. Um, there's a, we'll continue to do these talks pretty much monthly throughout 2022. We hope to see you there. And if you have ideas for what we'll, we'll get more native plants out into the world. We're excited to talk to you. We're excited to talk to groups. If you have groups that you want us to talk to, we're, we're glad to talk to them, to meet with them. And we'll continue having these every month and sending you out. You can look up our CNPS YouTube page. The YouTube page has all kinds of terrific talks. We have Saxon Holt talking on summer dry gardens. We have Jennifer DeGraff talking on choosing plants. We have um, Hayden talking on installation. So we'll continue doing these. If you have things you want to know, specific ones, email us and let us know. So we're gonna let everybody continue with the, the chat and then we will wrap it up and we will see you hopefully next month. It's great to see people from so many different areas and yeah, hopefully you're you. all connecting with each other too.
Yeah, thanks for all the, you know, participation and this will be, we'll share out everything in this as well as the chat um, resources will sift through. So thank you. And also, you're also welcome to email us on places where we might not be, have been accurate, where we might be wrong. If you're going to heckle, you have to be witty. So send us information. We can always learn. And we're always up for learning more. So we will gladly take in more of that information. So we have, I think, I think we have questions on warming areas and um, we'll get into those in additional ones, but we're gonna go ahead and wrap this up tonight and we will see you all frighteningly in January. <laughs> I went great. great, thank you. Oh, talk about habitat for birds. Yes, we are huge bird fans. We do have a talk on that. John from Audubon is on in our, but we can talk more on that. We also need to talk more on pollinators and all of the rest of the things that make up biodiversity. Um, and get to know your local nurseries, depending on where you are, so many of them are doing terrific work. I see somebody mentioning Tree of Life in there. Mike Evans, totally a gem on learning things. Um, your bo local botanical gardens are terrific. Um, Theodore Payne, all of these terrific places. We're huge fans. So we will see you next month. And thank you for being here. We appreciate you. Good night, everybody. Thank you.